conflict. So how do we get out of this mess? George Santayana, American philosopher, said those who forget the lessons of history are condemned to repeat it. But the implication there is that the lessons of history are bad. Sometimes the lesson of history is good. Sometimes the lesson of history is a success story. And those who fail to learn the successes of history are condemned not to have the opportunity to repeat it. This book provides a template of hope on how the United States and Russia can move forward from this horrible situation we're in today. So I encourage people to uh, buy the book. I'll sign it, et cetera. Now, Amar mentioned something, and I, I'll, I'll throw it out to you. Uh, he, he said, uh, people are interested in the conversation I had with Roger Waters. And uh, I could stop right now and, and go straight to questions, or I can address this at this point in time. I'll, I'll leave it up to you. What would you guys want me to talk about, Roger? Everybody okay with Roger? All right, here we go. Me and Roger. And the reason why I want to talk about this is uh, it, it, it'll introduce me to you. So when you start asking questions, you know a little bit more about me. Um, in, in 1978, I was a uh, senior in high school. And all the people that listened to Pink Floyd were the, not the people I hung out with. <laughs> I was a Rolling Stones kind of guy. Some Girls was my album. And I hung out with the football team. We went up to the castle. We snuck beer up to the castle. We'd get out during the break, chug a beer, go back to class. I was trying to get Betsy Ensign to go to prom with me. She did. Uh, so <laughs> it wasn't a bad year. But all I was focused on was what was going to happen after high school. I wanted to go in the military. I was the child of the Cold War. I wanted to serve my country. I wanted to fight Russians. Fast forward, 1983 my senior year in college. I've just finished my summer, my final summer pro training program with the Marine Corps, officer candidate school. And I'm now looking at a piece of paper that says, if you sign this, you're going in the Marines. Now, this is something that everybody should think about, how a 17 year old is so gung ho because you don't know life. You don't know anything about life. You just wanna go to war. But at 23, after you've experienced a little bit of life, there's a little bit of hesitation. I mean, I still played football. I love football. I still drank beer. And I still like girls. But I wasn't thinking about taking the girls to the prom. I was thinking about marrying them and starting a family of my own. And um, an album came out. It was called The Final Cut. It's a Pink Floyd album. And... Uh, I put it on and I listened to it and it blew me away. Blew me away. Because it, it talks about war. The thing I'm getting ready to do. And I'm like, holy cow, this is serious stuff. This is, it's, it's, do I want to do this? And there's a song in particular called The Gunner's Dream. And um, you know, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna sing it, <laughs> but. Uh, it's basically about a, 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 a tail gunner and a bomber that gets blown out of the airplane. And as he's falling to the ground, certain of his death, he thinks about why I'm fighting. Is it, is it, why am I here? I'm about to die. Why am I doing this? And he, and he thought about his mom going to his funeral and, you know, what he could say to her to make it okay. You know, and he, and he, uh, and he said, a, a place to stay, something to eat, somewhere old heroes can walk safely in the street. He said, a place where you can speak out about your doubt and fears, and no one ever disappears. You never have to hear the standard issue kicking in your door. He said, we can relax on both sides of the tracks. In maniacs. Don't blow holes. In bandsmen by remote control. He said,
Everybody has recourse to the law. And no one kills the children anymore. No one kills the children anymore. I said, damn it, I can do that. I can fight for that. And I signed the paper. I joined the Marine Corps. Fast forward. February 1991. Gulf War. I'm in the thick of things. I'm involved in the counter scud operations. Scud missile is the Iraqi, Soviet-made Iraqi missile. They're firing them at us in Saudi Arabia. They're firing them at Israel. When they fire them at Israel, and then let's take the politics out of this, people. Let's just talk about humans. When they fired at Israel, the first time they fired it, the missile hit the ground. It had some resi residual fuel in it. One, of, Some of the fuels, uh, it's called IRFNA, uh, inhibited red nitric fuming acid. It's red. And when the, is the Israelis put everybody they told them the, the Iraqis might be using chemical weapons. So all the Israelis built this special room in their home where they saran wrapped it, made it proof, and they gave gas masks to everybody. And the families were in there, and they were panicked. Imagine this. You've got a gas mask. You're not properly trained on the gas mask. And suddenly you're told, alarm, alarm, alarm. You're in your room, and you're putting the gas mask on yourself, and you have a baby, and you're putting the gas mask on the baby, too. The missile hits. The first responders from Israel come in with their detectors and they misidentify the fuel as chemical agent. So they don't lift the alarm and the families are in this room, but the baby can't breathe. And the mother's sitting there holding the baby and the baby's struggling. But the mother can't take the mask off because it's chemical weapons. And the baby dies. This happened over and over and over again. No one kills the children anymore, but they're dying. And I'm aware of that. So I need to get rid of these scuds. That's my job. Now, before I came to the war, back when I was doing the inspections, I, um, I was asked to go do an inspection. They called them radiation detection inspections of SS-25 missiles, which are big missiles that we thought could be hiding the SS-20s. Long story short, we'd go there. We'd set up this detector. We'd measure the radiation from the warhead. We'd determine whether it's one warhead, SS-25, three warheads, SS-20. That's not why I was sent. I was sent because I was a good observer. And I, um, I would observe these missiles up close. And then later on, when we fly back, the CIA would uh, have me draw sketches of it. The sketches were deemed to be so good that I was invited to a place called the Foreign Intelligence Division, United States Air Force. And they were building a radar that could be put on a B-52 bomber and fly over the Soviet Union and discriminate between decoys and the real thing. And they needed me to talk about materials, angles, all the things that are involved in radar absorption, radar reflection. And I did it. It was pretty cool. But then I left. Now I'm in Iraq and I'm taking a look. The Iraqis only had 19 launchers, but I'm looking at the reports and we've killed 60. <laughs> Now, Marines aren't very good at math, but I'm telling you right now, if they only have 19, we've killed 60, something's wrong. There's decoys out there. They're using decoys. So I said, hey, they have this radar, and why don't I go in and inspect some of the sites that we bombed and reconstruct the radar signature of the decoy that's there so that we can bring in this bomber, fly it over, and we could discriminate between the real thing and the fake thing and take it out. And they went, that's a great idea, Scott. So I got sent to the SEALs and we were going to go in and we we're going to go to this one site that we had picked out where it looked like it was a scud got bombed and we were training up to do the mission. Turned out it wasn't a scud. It was a Bedouin tent at night. The silly Bedouins brought their sheep in and the infrared signature on the Maverick missile picked up a long, what looked like cylindrical object. And when they fired the Maverick in there, it blew up and they said killed scud, but it was just a bunch of dead sheep and dead Bedouins. So they canceled the mission. Then I got invited to go to this other unit, these really special guys. You might have heard of them, Delta Force, the best of the best. Delta Force is up north in Saudi Arabia. They're crossing into Western Iraq, and they're hunting the scuds. And they had found something that looked like a scud. I was sent up to investigate it. It was a decoy. This is what I wanted, the decoy. I needed to get that decoy. So I flew in, and I met with these guys. But as I talked to them, I noticed they're all a little bit down. They're a little depressed. Well, you see, the, the same night I arrived, the, that morning, every organization has its superstars. Delta Force had a guy named Patrick Hurley. Patrick Hurley was one of the original founding members of Delta Force. He went to Iraq to try and rescue people in Desert One. Um, 
it, during the, the Panama invasion, he was the sniper that took out the pa Panamanian with the grenades that was going to blow up Kurt Muse before um, that he could be rescued. Kurt Muse was a CIA agent being held by Noriega's people. The guy's a legend. And Patrick Hurley is out in Western Iraq with a patrol called Dart Patrol. And it's raining. The weather is miserable. And he's setting his guys in for the night. And he's up on top of a wadi and he slips and he falls 80 feet to the bottom. Now he gets up, he's feeling a little pain and he goes in, he says, hey, I, I fell. And his medic says, sit down, we stabilize him. We think you might have a spinal injury. We need a medevac. The weather sucks. They say, who wants to fly this mission? A guy named Charles Cooper says, send me. Mike Anderson, another pilot, send me. We need medics. Otto Clark, send me. Eloy Rodriguez, send me. We need crew chief, chiefs. Chapman, Mario Vega Valesquez, send us. And they flew in. Now, this is back in the day when you didn't have GPS on these helicopters. It was all done by time and direction. You had a map, you flew at a certain speed, a certain altitude for a certain time, hit a point and navigate. They had to do dead navigation hundreds of miles into Iraq to find this place in the middle of nowhere. And they did it. The weather was horrible. Sleet. You have to, you're flying low to the ground. You can't go high. The radar picks you up to get shot down. They're going in to rescue Patrick Curley. The medic on the scene comes out and he hears the helicopter coming because you can't talk on the radio because the Iraqis will pick up the signal and they'll come in and I'll attack you. So he breaks an infrared stick, puts it on a string and spins it. And the pilots can see the spinning arc and they come in and they land. And they load Patrick Curley up on the helicopter and they fly him back, but the weather's bad. The weather's really bad, horrible. So they're flying back and they get to the base, but it's fogged in, frozen fog. So they start making turns. Look, they asked them to turn on the lights. So they turn on the lights, but you can't see the lights. So Chapman and Vega Valsquez are leaning out the helicopter, looking, looking for the ground, looking for the ground. They make one pass. They can't do it. Otto Clark and Eloy Rodriguez are holding Patrick Curley stable because he has a spinal injury, and they're making turns. So they're trying to stabilize him. Meanwhile, Cooper and, and, uh, and, and, and Mike Alexander are trying to fly the airplane. They make one more pass, and they hit the ground. Helicopter flips kills everybody on board. Everybody's dead. That's why these guys are a little down when I'm coming in and all my glee saying, let's go find these scuds. Well, they worked with me and we did do that. But you know why we did it? To honor the sacrifice made by those seven men. They died for a reason. They died doing something. They died so that no one kills the children anymore. Now, the war ended. We didn't get the scuds, but I went on to the United Nations and I worked with Delta Force the entire time I was with the United Nations. They came in and we hunted down. We tried to account for the hundreds of missiles and missiles, hundreds or dozens of launchers. I worked with the helicopter pilots, Delta Force. By 1993, I was able to go to the director of the central agency and brief him that we could account for all the missiles. Well, the U.S. didn't believe us. They didn't believe us. 1994, I'm in Israel. This is a big deal. Ehud Segei is the director of military intelligence for the Israelis. And while I'm trying to get the Israelis to help us with intelligence information, the Iraqis are making a move on Kuwait, 1994, October. Now he has to go to the prime minister and say, do we issue gas masks to the Israeli people? The last time they did that, old people and children died. Panic. And, he, and he's like, so he comes to me and he says, Ritter, you're the scud guy. I have to go brief the prime minister right now. A decision has to be made tonight. Are there any scud missiles left in Iraq? Is Israel at threat? And I said, no, sir. Mission accomplished. We accounted for them all. And he went and briefed the prime minister. They didn't issue the gas masks. No more children died. It's like one of the greatest moments of my life. I was so proud, you know, because we, 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 we accomplished the mission. We gave purpose to the sacrifice made by those seven men. 2001, I've resigned from the special commission out of protest because the U.S. government was interfering with our work. And we're getting ready to go to war with Iraq again. We're getting ready to go to war with Iraq again. And one of the things we're saying is that the Iraqis have Scud missiles. And I'm going, no, they don't. <laughs> we got rid of them all. Mission accomplished. No more Scuds but no one's listening. 
I go to the record store. And there it is, the final cut, but it's a, it's the new version. It's not on vinyl anymore. It's on CD. And I'm like, whoa, let me look at it. They had a new song on there, a new song. I said, okay, well, I'm going to listen to this song. It's called uh, when, the, when the Tigers Broke Free. Blew my mind. It was dark all around. There was frost on the ground when the tigers broke free. And no one survived. And the Royal Fusiliers, Company Z, they were all left behind, most of them dead, some of them dying. And that's how the high command took my daddy from me. The guy who wrote that song was Roger Waters. Eric Fletcher Waters, Rogers was his father, Waters. In 1939, he was a conscientious objector. When the British were mobilizing for war against Germany, he said, I don't do that. I don't fight. And they gave him an exception. But 19, by 1940, he realized what the scourge of Nazism was. He changed his mind. He went to the board and he said, I need to serve my country. And they took him and they commissioned him a second lieutenant in the Royal Fusiliers. On 18 February, 1944, in the Battle of Anzio, Company Z was on the front line holding off the German attack when the Tigers broke free. They were all killed. Roger Waters lost his father in war, never got to know his father. That made me think, I said, my God, Chapman, I mean, Cooper. <laughs> Cooper had two kids. Mike Alexander, he had three kids. Otto Clark, three kids. Eloy Rodriguez, three kids. The high command took their daddy from them. They die in war. Why? Why did they die? It was supposedly to be the gardener's dream, a place to sleep, something to eat, a place where old heroes can walk safely down the street, but that wasn't happening. In March of 2003, Delta Force went across the border again into Iraq, chasing phantom scuds. The war wasn't over. It was all a lie. We didn't accomplish anything. Those men died for nothing. Those children lost their parents, their father for nothing. Cooper can't throw the football with Logan. Rodriguez had a daughter, Deanna. He can't walk her down the aisle when she gets married. They're gone forever. And then I take a look at what's happening today, the Cold War. We take a look at, you know, we, we had hundreds of thousands of men in Germany. We we're ready to go to war, and we brought that down. And yet today, we're back there cheering as we deploy more troops into Europe. USA, USA, cheering the troops. Now we come to the final song from the final cut, Southampton Dock. We disembarked in 45. No one spoke and no one smiled. There were too many spaces in the line. We gathered at the cenotaph and all agreed with hands on heart to sheathe the sacrificial knives. But now she stands on Southampton Dock with her handkerchief and her summer frock clings to her wet body in the rain, knuckles in quiet desperation, knuckles wide upon the slippery reins, she bravely waves the boys goodbye again. We haven't learned a damn thing. Not a goddamn thing. I'll take any questions you have. <laughs>